So last time um, we touched a little bit of chapter two, so I'm going to go through that part very quickly so that we, are, we end up exactly where we finished last time, and then we will provide more details. So the chapter two basically is the main, one of the main chapters in the book. This is the only chapter where we actually prove the maximum principle uh, for a very simple problem with certain assumptions that I will let you what those assumptions are and, and, and what, what can be done with those assumptions. But then in chapter three and four, we develop maximum principle for more complicated problems, but we actually don't prove it because the proofs are A, more complicated, and so they are beyond the scope of the course. So what I want to do is to give you an insight into the maximum principle in chapter two in a simple setting, then try to use those insight in chapter three and chapter four, and then give you the maximum principle to be used <clears throat> later on in the, in the in application chapters. But we will not be proving those maximum principles. So the main proof in the book is right here in chapter two, and some of the notations we did for norms and things like that, little o, those notations, they are basically coming in chapter two. We will probably not be needing much of those later uh, in the book, but given that chapter two is important and this is the only time you're gonna actually see <clears throat> the value of the, 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 <clears throat> the necessary conditions. So that's, that's what's going on, okay? So I'm gonna go. So we already went through that, and and uh, towards the end, <clears throat> you see that we, it's not completely rigorous. We use dynamic programming, so we're going to go through dynamic programming example, and then at the end we do a statement of sufficiency conditions, and finally there's a computational method that uses Excel spreadsheet to solve slightly more complicated problems that you cannot do analytically. Okay, so that's kind of end of this chapter. So the problem that we're going to deal with <clears throat> is given by this. We have a differential equation, but the differential equation has a kind of a control variable which we do not know. But you see what happens is that this control variable in some sense will become a function of x and a t. So once you put that function of x and t, this becomes a differential equation and it has an initial condition. So then there's a theory of differential equation that allows us to solve that equation if you knew this u in terms of x and t, because right now we don't know. So what the optimal control does is to try to find out optimally what that ut should be. And once you find that ut should be, then you are back in the differential equation, and then it's no longer optimal control, it's more mathematics, okay? And while we will do most of the attention with X being one dimensional and U being one dimensional, so both them being scalars, but the entire theory with some matrix notation and a transposes goes through for vector cases. So in general, XT will be N dimensional vector, UT will be M dimensional vector. We will assume N and M to be finite. There are, there are, there are theories when N and M are not finite but we're not going to get there. And then there's these functions basically tells you that that function takes you from n dimension cross m dimension to one dimension into en, which is this one. That's an n-dimensional vector. So that's sort of what that function kind of means. We assume this to be continuously differentiable because that's what you need for the differential equation theory. And the notation, of course, xt is called the state trajectory, ut is a control trajectory. Sometimes we just say it control. We're going to assume that u comes from a set, <clears throat> which is could be a function of t. That means at each point in time t, u of t, which is our decision, must come out of that set. And that set could be different at different time t. But we are not requiring u to depend on x. That would be in chapter 3 and 4, okay? So right now we don't do that. Uh, we just, just have a simple exogenously given uh, constraint on the control. 
given that all of these taking place in over time, <clears throat> in the beginning, we're going to make the terminal time fixed. And so all of these things are functions on time. And because these are the trajectories, they have some cost associated with them. OK, so we 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 do the cost associated with the state and the control. We, we, had, we had three examples in chapter one of what these problems are. So, so you know, you know, you could be production, X could be inventory. So there's a cost associated with that. So what we do is we find the cost at each time T and then we integrate it. If you want to discount it, there is a discount available from this. See, there's a function of T. So I can actually, I can actually use a discount factor, which would be a function of T if I want to. So right now it's more general than a discounting. It's discounting just a special case of this form. And then at the end of T, we don't want to just leave the, the company with nothing. So it is a possible that there is some salvage value of the state that we have developed over this over from zero to T. And that salvage value could be here and it could also be discounted. So in general, that could be a function of T as well as the state at X T. OK. <clears throat> So, so those are, that's a, that's a problem. <clears throat> so basically we have this problem. We want to maximize an objective function subject to some U which depends on omega T at each point T. And we are maximizing over the whole trajectory, this functional. And the, the relationship between U and X is given by this state equation. Now, if I have a function of the trajectories without being an integral, that is a function of a function, that is not an optimal control problem. That would be almost an impossible problem to solve. But that that would be more general than this particular setting. So the optimal control problem is actually a highly special case of a dynamic problem where the objective function could be a function of the trajectories. Not, not the function at each point in time, then take the integral. OK, because functions of trajectory, for example, if I give you f of x of t, which is x t is a trajectory, that is a function of a function. And it may not be, one may not be able to express that as an integral form. So the, the ability to form that integral form is very important. And that is, that is the limitation, if you want to call it a limitation of optimal control problem. But most problems that we solve usually take this form because A, the other form is very difficult to specify. For example, people don't know how to evaluate the trajectories in a trajectory space and their cost. That's one way to figure this out. And the other one is if you could do that, we don't know how to solve the problem. So because of these two difficulties, the world looks at a dynamic problem from this lens. <clears throat> this, is, this is about as general as it gets in some way. I already told you that there are different forms available, and we actually converted the Bolza form to the, to the linear Meyer form by going to this trans transformation. And I think that's where somewhere where we stopped in some way. Um, as you can see, in, in doing so, we needed to define an additional variable. So now the y, which is the state variable, is n plus one dimension, n, n coming from the x, and the n plus one, n will n, n plus one coming from the, this, this one that we defined. So while we convert the Bolza form into a linear Meyer form, the form is simpler, but we do it at the expense of adding one more variable. <clears throat> and so this now we have a we have a we have a form that we define. Um, I think there is an example uh, of of this conversion. I, I I believe that is in the slide as well. So we will we will go through that when they, when that comes. Otherwise, it is in the book. Okay. <clears throat> The solution of that is done by dynamic programming. And binary programming has a principle of optimality that actually is very easy to prove, but I want to 
attract to some, we, we proved this last time, right? But I just want to say that there's one important part of this proof that is, that is important for mathematics people. And that part of the proof is that when I say suppose it is not, suppose that this path, which is blue, is not optimal when we begin at B. B meet at another time. So we suppose we solve the problem for A to E. And suppose this is time zero, this is time capital T. And so we get a whole path. <clears throat> Remember it's a deterministic problem. So everything is deterministic. And we suppose we implement this path up to, up to this time T, small t, let's say. Now I have an initial state XT here, which I got it by applying this optimal control from A to B. And now suppose I resolve the problem for small t to t. I can call this another zero if I want to call it, but this is a problem from zero to some time t. And if I resolve this problem, I want to show that from that point, starting from that point, this blue will still be optimal. That is Bellman's optimality principle. And the proof is gone by saying, suppose it is not optimal, then there's another one. Now, there is another one means that there is exist one. What if there doesn't exist one? Then this proof breaks down. So the existence is assumed here and most of the time we don't worry about it, but it is important and I want to tell you just briefly why it is important and why we in chapter three or four will give some existence conditions, but we will not really spend too much time Whenever you write a paper and there's an issue of existence, you just go through the literature and find out what are the conditions they give you and you just verify those conditions. Proving those conditions is not an easy task. It's another course all by itself. And that course requires a little bit more mathematical muscle than even what we need here. So if uh, Kushali can give me a whiteboard, let's try to use the whiteboard for this, this little side thing for existence. Sally, can you give me a whiteboard? Yes. Use your whiteboard. Okay, so I'm going to use um, green pen. I'm going to show that n equal to 1 is the largest number. Okay, I'm going to give you a proof. Okay, so the proof says, let n be the largest number. This is largest number, okay? So, I, I cannot do better than that. So, clearly, I'm now giving you a proof, okay? So, Clearly, if n is the largest number, n is going to be bigger than or equal to 1. We know that. There's no, no argument there. Any number that is bigger than or equal to 1, its square is usually bigger than or equal to that number. So n squared has to be bigger than or equal to n, bigger than or equal to 1. No problem there. So far, no problem there. Because n is the biggest number, n squared cannot be bigger than n, so n squared has to be equal to n. No problem there. And I want to solve this equation. Well, there are one solution is zero, but the zero does not satisfy this feasible condition. Okay, so zero is ruled out. The second is one, and one satisfies this. So that's only the solution that I have of this, so I have proved that one is the largest number. I done the proof. Anyone tell me where is the mistake? Where is the mistake in this proof? Clearly five is bigger than n, bigger than one. So it cannot be, a, the, the, the result cannot be right. So the proof has to be wrong somewhere. And where is it wrong? Okay, 
I am going to call Muhammad here. Yes, Professor. I was thinking maybe that crossing N from each side of the equality N to equal to N. Maybe that's the mistake there. Okay. The, the, okay, I want to tell you, there is no mistake here. <laughs> so the mistake is right here. Let N be the largest number in order for me to assume that I have to prove that there exists the largest number. And there doesn't exist any. So if I were to prove that, so if I assume something that does not exist, I can pretty much prove everything. Everything stupid I can prove. I can prove n equal to one is the largest number. I can prove three equal to four. I can prove all sorts of stuff if I assume something that does not exist. So that's why I'm just trying to emphasize to you that existence is important because if you exist, if you assume existence and it doesn't exist, you can prove anything, pretty much anything. Okay, so that that is, it's called a parent's paradox because of the way it is very simple and it's very easy to express. By the way, let us let us just to tell you one more thing. One could argue that infinity is another solution of this. Of course, infinity is larger than any number, but infinity is not a number. So there's no other number. So to prove the largest number, for example, for example, m, let m be large, then m plus one is larger than m, m. The m plus one is larger than m plus two is larger than that. So there is no largest number. Do you understand what I mean? You give me any number, I can give you a bigger number. So existence doesn't work. Okay, so this is this is all I'm gonna do. So let's go back to our Bellman's optimality principle and the slides, Kushali. Okay, so once you assume that exists and if existence is correct, then Bellman optimality principle goes through and that's all I wanna show here. <clears throat> and the proof is trivial. The biggest part of the proof is existence. So in any particular problem, if you wanna use this, you need to assume and as that assumption has to be correct in some way or another. Somebody has to tell you that yes, somebody has proved it for you. Okay. So, <clears throat> this is a very quick example of <clears throat> converting that to Bolza form. So let me just tell you why that thing works. Notice, notice this part here <clears throat> in this definition. This two expression is ds by dt. Because if you have a ds with a function of two variable, if I take the total derivative, then total derivative ds by dt is first take the partial derivative x, then take the x with respect to t, that gives you f because that's x dot, and then take the partial derivative with respect to t. So this whole thing is ds dt. And when you take ds dt, when you integrate ds dt, so, so, then you get st minus s0. You see this? So when you integrate, when you integrate this, this becomes yt minus y0. This is the integral from zero to t. This becomes s at t minus s at zero. So you see, you get this. So that is the main part of the proof. And then everything works. Then it's identity, right? So let's just quickly look at that. I now have an example in Bolza form. I have an x dot. So I do y2 dot. y2 dot is this f here. And then this is delta s delta x. So this is this is this is your s function. That there is no t here, so there is no so there is no this. So this one, this one is not there, only this one is there. So I take the derivative with respect to x and I multiply by x dot, which is f. So I take the derivative of that with respect to x, that is that is two times x, but two times divided by one four is half. So that is half times x, and they multiply that by x dot, which is u, so it is u. So you get y2 dot equal to this, and y2 zero is the initial value, which is initial value at zero, okay? Okay. So now y2 t, I take the integral of this, Notice the integral of this, this becomes a full derivative, total derivative. 
So that becomes this when you take the integration and that becomes this. So we have exactly the objective function that we are looking for, that is J. So by doing that, we got the objective function J. And now J is Y2T because Y2T, sorry, Y2T is exactly J. And so we got J and we got X dot and Y2 dot. So we have two dimensional e equation now. We have a two dimensional state. One is X, one is Y2. We call it Y. So this could be Y1, this is Y2, okay? And there's the initial condition. So, so that's how you convert that problem. And the, and the conversion is general, okay? So this is all we need to do here. So now I want to go through dynamic programming. I want to go to dynamic programming. Has everyone gone through this example? Yes. Anybody has not said say no, please. Okay. And 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 it is important to go through this one more time because when we derive the maximum principle, we'll take a very big leap from this to the next stage. But the leap is big, but it's very intuitive. There's a parallel, you can kind of look at the parallel one by one, you can look at each, each step. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. So in old days, people would go from San Francisco to New York City via stagecoach. The stagecoach is basically a terminal or a junction where people would regroup. So people who are going from San Francisco to New York City and people going in between cities will all start from here and they will go to some junction. Okay, NYC people can go to any of these junctions, but people who want to go to Chicago can only go to this one and this one. And it can also go to this one. But anyway, so that's what I mean by that. So people will come to here and then they will regroup. People will go regroup because they, 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 these are three stage coaches. Now there will be three going from there, three going from there. So there'll be nine stage coaches, maybe smaller stage coaches. And then people will go to different stage coaches and go to their next destination. And they would have to pay the ticket. The ticket price may depend on the distance as well as it may depend on the terrain. It may depend on <clears throat> the animals, risk that you take. Uh, in those days, they were also, if you want to be not politically correct, they were also considered the risk from Native American Indians uh, because they will go through the territory, which was, which was not yet uh, simulated. And so there would be uh, attacks from those people. And you've seen John Wayne movies uh, and you see those kind of attacks. So, so the ticket price may include everything. So we're going to call a cost of a ticket. The cost of a ticket is given in this table. So going from two to five, the cost is seven dollars. Okay. And going from going from five to eight, the cost is one dollar. Going from one to two, the cost is two dollars, which is written on the arc. This is the written on the arc. So I did not put a mat matrix here because I can write it there. Okay. So that's our definition. <clears throat> our problem now is to find the minimum cost path from San Francisco to New York City. That's our object. And we're gonna do by using Bellman's optimality principle. What does the Bellman optimality principle says? It says that I'm gonna find the optimal path from different places. And then I'm gonna use those optimal path to eventually build an optimal path from San Francisco to New York City. So I'm gonna go backward. Okay, I'm gonna backward. And so let's, let's see what we do. <clears throat> First, there's something called a myopic path or a greedy path. That says at every stage I choose the best path. So if I go from one, I like three paths, two is the cheapest, so I go from one to two. When I'm at two, I look at these three paths, four is cheapest, so I go to six. And so I go to nine and go to 10. So a path that I create is one, two, six, nine, ten. The cost of that path is two plus four, six, six plus three, nine, nine plus four, thirteen. So that's a path. And, and it's easy to see that that path is not optimal 
not minimal, because just to go from here to there, this will cost six and, and the other path costs four. The red path only costs four dollars. So clearly, I can substitute that path by this path and I can do better. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is the greedy path, and there are a lot of lot of literature of greedy heuristics, because sometimes we cannot solve the problem. <clears throat> and so sometimes we go for greedy heuristic and we try to find out how good the greedy heuristic is. But here we're only using greedy heuristic to tell you that is not optimal. So now we use a dynamic program. <clears throat> Let one, so this is one, I will call this to be a decision U1. That means going from one to this, I will call this U1. U1 has three possibilities, two, three, and four. And from there, I will call this to be U2, and U2 has three possibilities, five, six, seven. So doing this way, I have a path called one, U1, U2, U3, 10. Let this be the optimal path. <clears throat> Once again, you are assuming that there exists a path. But you know, this is only finite. I can actually find every path. I have enough time on this small problem to find every path and choose the maximum. So given that it's a finite number and I'm choosing between finite things, I can easily compare them and I can find the optimal. So the existence of optimal path is trivial here. So existence is given, okay? We don't have to worry about it. Let's begin some stage. So I'm going to use state. This is stage one, this is stage two, this is stage three, this is stage four. And it's come from the word stage coach, because this is what is called the stage coach. Okay. So let this be the optimal path. Let f of n starting stage n and starting at the city s. So the city s would be either this one or this one or this one or this one, this one, this depends on where stage is. So stage can correspond to that city, okay. So certainly at that place, there's only city one, but here there are three possible cities. So let Fn, Sun be the minimum cost at stage N, given that the current state is S, which is the current city, and the decision taken, which is the next city, is Un, okay. <clears throat> Now I'm going to optimize over U n. That means what is the optimal path from n given s? Well, I maximize this over U n. So f n star s is minimum over U n. U n will be eligible cities from s. So I go from s to U n. Well, if I go from s to U n, my cost is C s U n. And once I'm at UN, I'm stage N plus one, and I'm on the city UN. So once I'm on N plus one stage, and in the city UN, since I have defined this, I also define this. And so if I go from S to UN, and then from UN optimally to the, to the New York City, then, this is the optimal path. So going from S, I can minimize over these cities. In this case, maybe just the three cities or the two cities, depending on which stage I am. I can minimize that. Then I will get the minimum from stage N. What I'm trying to do is this. If I know the optimal path from here to here and here to here, then I can construct the optimal path from here, here, and here to New York City. And once I know the optimal path from here and here and here to New York City, then I can consider the optimal path from here and here and here in New York City. Uh, how do I do that? Well, to construct the optimal path from here to New York City, I will choose this path and this path and take the best of those two. And that's your dynamic programming coming in. So I'm now changing the problem. I, I, I have this simple problem. And by solving the simple problem, I have slightly more complicated solution or a more complicated problem. So I'm bootstrapping. So I start from here and I bootstrap and come to the next stage here. Okay, it's almost uh, building a cantilever bridge. You know, you build a little part, then you stay on that bridge and you build the next part and you continue on. Okay. <clears throat> so stage four. Stage four, 
is this stage. So the, the state S is eight or nine. There's not much choice. So the, the optimal policy is basically this and this. So I can sort of see, show you this. So stage four, F4 star, F4 star S is, if I'm at eight, I go to U4, which is New York City, I, the cost is three. And if I'm at nine, I go to New York City, the cost is four, and the city is this 10, okay? Um, what am I doing? Yeah, eight, nine, yeah. The city is 10, which is New York City. So the city is 10. And going from eight to 10 cost three, going nine to 10, and there's only one choice. That's more complicated here. So if I am now at a state, which is, so I've already done this, okay? I've already done this, I'm now here. So I'm gonna take the five, six, seven as my S. So S is five, six, and seven. Well, from five, I can go to eight or nine. If I go to eight, my cost is given by one plus three equal to four, because if I go, to, go from five to eight, Five to eight is one, which is one. And then from eight, the cost is three. I know this from here. So I add this. See, remember this thing right here? I have four star three, which is right here. So I have a four. Okay. By doing nine, I can do the nine. And then between four and eight, the four is the best. And four was obtained by going through eight. So I put four, which is my F3 star of S, and I go to eight. So F3 star, the best path from five to go to New York City cost you four. Similarly, best path from the this, from this city six to go to New York City cost you seven. And from seven goes to six. So I have F3 star S, this is number D. I go to F2 now, stage two, I have cities two, three, four. Now look what happens. I can go from two to five, six or seven. If I go from two to five, the cost is seven. And then once I'm at five, I use this number five, which is coming from the previous side called F4 star five, which is four. So I use four, so seven four four is 11. By going this through this, I can find all the costs and I can see now there are two, two paths which are good. So I have cost is 11, this is unique. This has to be unique, but this doesn't have to be unique. So I put five and six. Similarly for three, this city is also unique. From four, the city also five and six. So I have from S and now go from one. Well, one I can go from two, three, four. And if I go from go to two, I get 13. You go from three, I get 11, go to four, 11. So again, there are two parts of the cost is 11, three to four. So first of all, the total cost is 11 which is better than greedy part 13. Okay, that's why I, I put another line there. So I do, I do, I have an optimal path now, which is better than the greedy path. And how do I get the optimal path? I solve the backward, now I have to go forward. How do I go forward? Well, I go to one, I already know from one, I should go to three, so I go to three. But from one, I can also go to four. So I construct one to three and one to four. That is part of the path I constructed. Once I'm at three, I can go to five because that's the only choice. Once I'm at five, I go to eight, I, so I got 10. So this is one path, cost is 11. Second path is one to four. But once I'm at four, I can go to five or six. So I have one, four, five, and one, four, six. Those are the path created. But once I'm five, I have no choice, so I go to here. From six, I have no choice, go to here. Again, the cost is 11. So I created three optimal path, cost 11. I solve the dynamic programming problem using Bellman's optimality principle. Professor, can you? Yes. I do have a question. You just said that they bootstrap. That word was kind of familiar to me because I have read something uh, regarding this dynamic programming previously, and I heard that word before. But uh, to be honest, in that case, I didn't understand exactly what does bootstrap mean. And you just oh, said the that bootstrap here. is bootstrap is. Okay, you know what a bootstrap is? When you, when you wear a boot, you're lacing the boot. So you put that lace first on the first two holes, and after you put the boots on the first two holes, you go to the next two holes, right? And you go to the third hole, which is the next third hole. That's called bootstrapping. And then eventually you, you do the whole bootstrap. Uh, um, uh, Kushali, can you give me the whiteboard, please?
Yes, give me one second. Okay. Let me erase this. Erase those. Okay, thank you. So, let me do this. So, this is a whole, 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 whole. This is your boot. And you lace like this. And then once you have this, you go like this and you go like this. So, you got these two. Then you go like this and you go like this. And then you tie, tie the knot. That's your bootstrapping. Let's go to another example. You want to build a cantilever. Okay. How do you build a cantilever? You are here and you can reach this far. So you can put, you can start putting some a stone or whatever, and you, you put some concrete and you stone is strong enough, you can go to here, right? Then this person who is here can go up to here. He now standing here. He take another stone and he, he, he ties another stone to this stone. Now these two stones are good enough. And now he can actually go here. Again, you can do that, you can go here. Now, provided these are good enough, you build the cantilever. Now, if it's a big span, you need a bridge. And the bridge, you cannot cantilever because you're gonna break down. So you need some kind of a support here. Then you build another cantilever, you build another support here, then you build another one. And finally, you build the bridge, which is a big support. And these could be temporary support, you can remove them. So that's kind of a bootstrapping operation. Did you get that now? Uh, kind of. Yeah, so you uh, solve the problem. So go back to our example. Go back to our example. Uh, uh, slides, please. Kusali, slides. Yes, Professor. Yeah. Takes a second. So. In our example, what we are doing, what we are doing is we are basically building this optimal path, which is very easy to build. And once I have these two optimal path, these optimal path from five, six, seven are also easy to build. I'm remember I'm building optimal path from five to ten. I'm I, I'm building optimal path I, I, and it will decide which city I go to. I'm building an optimal path from six to 10. Once I have these optimal path, then I go here and I build these optimal paths. So you see, I'm going from this optimal path, from optimal path to this part, then optimal path to this part, and finally optimal path all the way from here. And that bootstrapping is going on by this. So I have, I start with the, the last stage and I already know what to, how to solve that. Then I go to this stage and, and by doing this and by this minimum operation, I, I build this stage. Then once I have this stage, I bring it here and I go to Fn minus one. Remember this is N plus one, I reach N. Once I have N, I put N here and I become N minus one. When I reach N minus one here, I get N minus two. Eventually I get to one. You see what I'm saying? So you yes. move from you move from here to here, from here, N to N minus one to N minus two, to finally to one. Yes, so that, can, we say, can we say this sequential backward movement is kind of... You can say recursion, yes. Yeah, okay. it's a recursion, Perfect. it's a backward, yes. That's a dynamic programming recursion, absolutely right. Perfect. But, Thank you, so much. you know, layman people don't know what a recursion is. So we need to, we need to tell them what is going on. I see. Perfect. Thank you. So now we're going to take a big leap and actually derive the maximum principle by using dynamic programming. By using dynamic programming, we give some rigor. We, we do not have a totally rigorous proof, but it's very intuitive. The proof is very intuitive. And I appreciate more intuition right now for this course than the rigor. Uh, <clears throat> but if you write the paper, you need to be rigorous. But if you, you know, if you, if you are trying to understand something, the intuition is, 90% of the mathematics, the 10% is rigor. Okay, so let's go here. 
So I'm going to now define. So what I'm going to do now, so my problem is from zero to capital T, okay? Some T here somewhere. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the problem from some T, that is my stage, okay? So I'm going to take a, a stage, which is T, and because this continuous time, let's forget the continuous time for the time being, let's assume that I break this interval into interval of delta T. So zero to delta T, delta T to two delta T, eventually I come to T, then T plus T delta T, T plus two delta T, T plus three delta T, eventually I get to get capital T, okay? So these are my stages. So let's assume that we have a discrete problem right now, <clears throat> and our, our stage is length from T to T plus delta T. <clears throat> and the city I'm going to assume is X. So I am now in stage T and my city is X. Okay. And at stage T, I'm going to make the decision for the next city. So the next city is X plus delta X. Okay. And the next stage is T plus delta T. So I'm notice from VXT, I will have the I will have VX plus delta X, T plus delta T. So the dynamic programming want me to express VXT in terms of VX plus delta X, delta T. That is the recursion. So I want to develop the recursion equation from an earlier stage to the next stage. So that's one part. What is the difference? Well, the difference is I have to I have to choose a city. Now, if you look at the problem here, sorry, I have to choose this city, okay? And this city or this city from one. But in order to choose that city, I have to choose a stagecoach, which is the path. So in this case, choosing the stagecoach and choosing the city is the same thing, right? It is the same thing. Now, suppose there was a choice between going here. Suppose there were two choices here. One was to going by stagecoach, one was going by horse. And one was maybe going by a train, if the train was there. So then I have to choose to go to the city and I have to choose to decide which one, which path, which, which, which vehicle, which course of thing, whatever it takes. So that is your control variable. Each of the control variables will bring you to this city, right? And, and there will be a cost. There'll be different costs of these. And I may not maximize, I may, I may maximize again cost and there may be other objective function. I may have a convenience and my objective function may be function of cost and convenience, whatever. So the control and the city is the same. What is the difference here? The difference here is in order to choose the city, X plus Delta T, I have to choose a control. So when I'm in the city X, okay, I have to choose a control to go to the next stage, okay? And so the X plus Delta X will be given in terms of U. So that is the difference, but that is difference is, is, is important, but it is, it's, it's easier to know that difference so that the city and the control in, the, in that example is the same. Here, the control and the cities are different, okay? So, so let this be the optimal path. And along the optimal path, I have this one and this one. This is the optimal solution of going from X to T all the way to capital T. And that is the optimal cost of going or optimal profit in there because we are maximizing optimal profit going from this city X plus Delta X all the way to capital T. So I'm going to do the following. How do I go from X to T to this love? Well, look, suppose I use a control U tau, which is Delta tau, U tau in Omega tau, for each tau in T to T plus delta T. So right now, because it's continuous, I can do that, but if it's not continuous, I can just use some control and go to the next city. But, but 
even though I'm using the discrete example to, to connect with the stagecoach problem, I'm, I'm still going to keep the continuous time between t to t plus delta t for the cost purposes. So what if I use the control u tau, tau in t to t plus delta t, then my cost from t to t plus delta t is f of x tau u tau tau d tau. Whereas x tau is given by this equation. This equation. So when I use the u tau, I can substitute u tau. I solve this equation from t to t plus delta t. When I solve this equation from t plus delta t, my new city will be x sub t plus delta t. So the x sub t plus delta t comes from solving the differential equation that begins with x, uses the control u tau from t to t plus delta t, and when whatever that tau, when you solve the differential equation, I will get a new state. The new state is my new city. So I choose the control, and the control tells me which city I'm going to go to. Okay, so that's what's going on here. So that is our cost, C of S, C of X, X plus T, delta T, or C of X is U, okay? So that's our initial cost. And then the next is, I am at this city now, X T plus delta T, which I will find out. I'm at this city, and I'm at this time. So my recursion equation, which is very close to this equation. See, I, let's look at this equation. So I am now, this is my Vxt. This is my Vxt, t plus delta t. This is my that integral, which is going from s to un, which is the cost from going from x to this city. So, so this is, this is that, that optimal cost from this time on. This is the optimal cost from this time on. This is the city. This is the city along the optimal path that I will reach. I will reach by using that control. Whatever the control is, I will get that trajectory and that trajectory will bring me here. That will tell me this city is X plus delta X. Okay. So the principle of optimality says that I have incremental from incremental change in J come from t to t plus delta t is two parts. One is this running cost, and one is this, this optimal objective function, value function, we call it, from t plus delta t. So this is the part. That's it. That is Bellman's optimality principle. And I go to one more step, and after that, it is not, that's it. This is the Bellman's optimality principle. The next is calculus. You, you, you're done. You're done with the stage course example. And now what is left for me is nothing but calculus. So, so I'm going to now resort to calculus. F is continuous function and delta T is small. So I can, I can approximate this continuous function by simply the value at time T and the value at X and just multiply it by delta t. So what I'm trying to do is approximating this by the slope here and multiplying by delta t that slope and getting there, getting there like this with a straight line. When I go to the straight line, clearly the integral of that and the integral of straight line, there's a little bit of a difference, but that little bit of difference is going to be small. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this. This is the small difference. So the small difference between integral of this path and a straight line times the slope, slope times delta t, which is given by this, gives me O delta t. So by approximating that integral by this, I have this. But notice when I approximate this, I only need a control at omega t. I don't need a path. I don't need a path from t to t plus delta t. I know I need only a control, not even a trajectory from t to t plus delta t. This, this is a trajectory. I don't need a trajectory anymore. I only need the slope, which is u. So I only optimize over one variable, m, m dimensional variable, if you call it. But let's not worry about m. Let's, let's, let's assume u to be scalar, x to be scalar. So I only have single dimensional variable, and it's not a trajectory is not a function over time. It is just a number. 
so I can maximize over a number. That's a regular problem. If I if you give me this, if you give me this, you give me this. So now I have to find what is this in terms of this u? Well, that's very easy, right? So we we can we can take Taylor series of this guy. So I'm going to take the Taylor series. Remember the x of t plus delta t is not the same. So I'm going to take the x of t plus delta t. This is the this is this is the function. I'm going to take the Taylor series. What does the Taylor series tell you? Well, it's v x t. Then I take the derivative of this with respect to x, and and then derivative of x with respect to t. So that's the first term. Then I take the derivative of this with respect to t. So I get this times delta t, and I get again another o delta t. O, o delta t plus this o delta t will be an a, again o delta t. All the sum of o delta t will be o delta t. They go to zero when delta t goes to zero, because in the end I'm going to let delta t go to zero, and these guys are going to disappear. So that's what's going on right now. So. Remember now, Bellman has done his job. Dynamic program has done his job. Now we are basically doing the calculus. <coughs> so I got Taylor series. Well, I can substitute x dot, substitute x dot by f d t. Okay, so that is the slope. That is the slope. That is the x dot. At x when I use u, and that slope multiplied delta t will give me. So I have a slope which is f u dt. I multiply by delta t. That slope is given and will get to get to me here. So that is the city now. I get to. Okay, and now what is happening is this function now is only a function of u. You see u here. It's only there's no there's no trajectory here there's no time function there's no functional it's just function of u okay so just some algebra here vxt vxt it doesn't depend on u so i can cancel on both sides so i get zero equal to this then i divide by delta t when i divide everything by delta t well this becomes that this becomes f and the or delta t divided by delta t goes to zero <clears throat> So I get this. <clears throat> Notice now, I have a maximization problem only in terms of u. That is just a, just a math programming problem, very simple. I can take the derivative with respect to u, first order condition that we know to maximize this, this inside. <clears throat> okay, so I have once I clearly <clears throat> a u that will maximize this function will depend on x and t. So once I have that u as a function of x and t, I can remove the max. If I remove the max, you can see this is a partial differential equation. Delta v delta x plus delta v delta t plus some function equal to zero and boundary condition is given by this because remember, that is the last. If I am at capital T with respect to X, then my cost is exactly this. Right there, because this, this, this adds nothing. If I am at capital T, this is zero. I only have this as part of the objective function. So I have VX capital T is given by that. So all differential equations need boundary conditions. So we have a boundary condition and a differential equation. So, so far, we use a calculus, approximation, and a Taylor series. Next stage. Uh, excuse me, Professor. Yes. So before you proceed, I have a question. So here we, we, assume, we assume there is no time discount factor came in. So I was wondering if we, if we incorporate the time, the time discount into well, the time discount equation. is no problem because this is this is you can put e to the minus delta t later on in the yes. book in chapter three or chapter three I believe we're going to rederive this when there's a discount rate. Okay, okay. so 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 I was I, I was thinking maybe it's a little bit earlier to talk about that question. So I was thinking if we 
um, for example, if we want to rewrite the equation 2.14, so actually in the left hand in the left hand side, we will have. Yes, you um, will have something here. Yes, yeah, yes. You will have something here. That is true. But 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 this is v sub t, right? Uh huh. So v sub t has that. I I did not take the derivative yet, right? Yes. So I can do the same thing there. If, uh, I, so I, would... sub, if I define the VXT, uh -huh. I don't have to take the derivative yet, right? You can just leave it like this. Take the yes. derivative when you need to. Yes. Yeah. You, will see. you the... will see what happens. Right now, I don't need it. Okay. okay. Because, because if you take the discounting, this is more general than discounting. Yes. So you don't have to worry about it. You can substitute the discount at the very end. Okay. You don't have to do it now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You can do it at the very, very end. Okay. Right okay. now, everything okay. is perfect. Without, without, you just don't worry about it. <clears throat> okay. Right. So I, I, I'm just concerned about that. Maybe the equation in the left hand side of the equation, it's not, it's, it's not zero. No, it's no, it is correct. Based. Everything is correct. Okay. This is VTXT. It is correct because. I'm taking that as the present value VXT. Uh -huh. This is the value. This is the this is the this is the value. This is the value at VXT. This is the value right here, right here. Oh, okay. Okay. So okay. This, is, this is not a problem. Okay. Thank you. You can continue. <laughs> yeah. No, but we will see later because what. <clears throat> What you do can be done here, but the reason I will do it again is because I will do something more. So okay. after that, I will simplify that further for that particular special case. That's why, um. I, that's why I don't want to bring the special case here right now, because right now we are, we are doing a general case. This is the standard formulation. The standard formulation, you don't worry about that. Okay. Thank Later you. on, I will tell you the difference between those two. You will see mm -hmm. more, more then in the next chapter. Okay. Thank you. Actually, actually, I will give you, since you are going to be reading that chapter, I will tell you on where we do that. OK, so. We do that on page 85 of the book. OK. And just make sure that you look at the corrected pages because 85 of 85 that proof uh, has been corrected because there was a typo in there. OK, I was it's. Uh... Yeah. So Page please look at corrected pages. Corrected pages are important there because there are two or three typos here. OK. OK, so. Um, five. Yeah, you, you do that at home, OK? Not sure, now. sure, 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 I will. Because. Yeah. Okay. OK, I will see. So it's kind of like equation 3.53 or something. Yeah, yeah, it will be. But then. I do another transformation and that transformation gives you what is called a current value formulation of the maximum principle. Sure, sure, I will. Yeah. Thank right you. now we don't worry about the current value, present value because we don't have a discount rate. There's only one formulation right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> good question. <clears throat> so the next thing we want to do is the following. We want to now try to figure out, remember we've done this, but we don't know we. Right? We don't know V, only, only know V here. And, it, and if we can find the value U, we can solve for V by solving the partial differential equation. So we have converted the control problem to a math problem, but it is still not, it's, a, it's still more complicated. So I want to go to further stage to get some handle on this V, okay? So we're going to define V sub X. Notice V sub X 
if v is the value of the state x at time t, then v sub x is the marginal value of the state x at time t, right? So that's a marginal value of the state x. What does that mean? I mean, let me mention that to you a little bit later. So call this lambda t, it's a vector, okay? But think only in terms of scalar. So if you think in terms of scalar, then lambda t will also be scalar, okay? Remember, this is a row vector. If you take the v sub x, it's a gradient, it's a row vector, so lambda t will also be a row vector. So that's that's what I mean by. But if you if you if you, if if, if, la, if x is one dimensional, then lambda t is one dimensional, so row and column are the same. It doesn't matter. So <clears throat> what does that mean? That sort of says that if for some reason I'm at x and you give me a little bit more of x, let's say epsilon. So then I am at x plus epsilon. Then what is the value of being at x plus epsilon? Suppose this is, suppose x is the, uh, uh, suppose x is the ton of steel. So suppose x is 10 tons right now. And suppose I, I'm giving one more ton. Let's one ton is small, let's see. So, I now know the value of being at 10 ton steel. What is the value of having 11 ton of steel? That is the marginal value of that extra steel. The derivative of that, once I know that function, I take the derivative, that is the additional value of extra steel or extra value of the state. So if somebody, if somebody offers me that steel for price less than my marginal value, then I should buy it, right? So it gives me the shadow price of the steel. Also shadow price, another word you can use. So the lambda t then is the marginal value of the state. And I can write something called the Hamiltonian function, which is nothing but f plus lambda times f. If I define this function, then the previous equation can be written this way. So this equation that I have here, 2.15, I can write it this way. Okay, so at this point, this partial differential equation is called Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equation. Bellman, because we use the Bellman optimality principle to get this max, and Hamilton-Jacobi are the people who worked on calculus of variations, and so we put their name in there. Well, what does this mean? If I'm maximizing with respect to you, Add a trajectory when x is x star, it means the following. It means that at time t, when I'm at the optimal x star t, and I'm using an optimal control u star t, then this Hamiltonian plus this term is bigger than or equal to that Hamiltonian when this is any other u. I'm now trying to say what this max over u mean? It means that at the trajectory, if I substitute that u star to any other u, then I will, in some cases, in most cases, I will have a lower value. That means this is the maximum value of all the u that I can use at this x star t. This is the best. So what I'm trying to say is that if I have an optimal trajectory from zero to capital T, then that optimal trajectory from zero to capital T will give me u star t at this point, at, at time t. It give me x star t at time t and u star t at time t. I'm now saying that that u star t I got must maximize this, this function at time t. So I'm taking a problem in a function space and saying that if that problem is optimal in the function space, then it should also be optimal in the regular standard space at time t. See, this is not a functional problem. It is at time t. Everything is time t. There's no time t doesn't change. And u only changes, but u is just one dimensional variable. It's not a function of time. So that is a static problem at time t. So a dynamic problem from zero to capital T 
must satisfy some condition at every time t, some static condition at every time t. So we are now saying that at every time t, the Hamiltonian must be maximized. It's important to know that. That if I have an optimal control, and that gives me an optimal trajectory state, then at this time, at this optimal x star t, and at time t, then the Hamiltonian at this time must be maximized. And Hamiltonian at this time is a math programming problem. It is not a control problem. It is not a calculus of variation problem. It is not a problem in function space. It is a problem in math programming space, just a regular problem. Notice we don't put lambda star <clears throat> because we obtain lambda only at the optimal trajectory. So we don't need a star. The lambda is at the optimal trajectory. But for x and u, we need a, u is feasible, u star is optimal, x is feasible, x star is optimal. Well, this lambda that has this property must have some some way of bringing us to this property. What is so great about this lambda that we can do this? So let me let me tell you a little bit more what is going on here. So at any given time, this is the instantaneous rate of profit. At any given time, and I use the control u and I and, and I'm at x then f of x u t is the rate at which x is increasing. And the incremental value of x can be multiplied by lambda, so that is the value of the increment. So what it is saying is that at, at any time t, I must maximize the, the, the running profit plus the profit of the increment. And that is, so if the thing is optimal, overall optimal, then it should also optimize at each point in time this 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 Hamiltonian, which means at each point in time it should maximize the running profit plus the the value of the incremental profit. So this lambda is very important because it tells me that if I maximize this at each point in time t, then I can build the problem for the function space. So I go the opposite now. So what I was saying, if the problem is optimal, then it is optimal at each point in t in the sense that the Hamiltonian at each point t is maximized. But that needs a lambda. Now suppose somebody gives me a lambda. So if I have the lambda, I can maximize this at time t. And I can find out u. So I can maximize it at every t, and I can find the u at every t. And if I can find the u at every t, I have constructed a trajectory u star of t from zero to t. So in order to solve the dynamic problem, I can solve the sequence of static problems, one at each t. So if it's a discrete time, t period, I can solve t, p, t problems. If it's continuous time, I solve infinitely many problems, but one at each t, okay? But at each t is not a function problem. So, so this, that is something what we get out of it. So what we are now saying is solving the dynamic problem is more difficult in some sense than solving the infinitely many problem one at each t. Because one at each t is a simpler problem to solve. And even if there are infinity of them, they are still simpler than solving the dynamic problem. So while it is simple, but it's not quite simple. Okay, so we keep going. So given this lambda is such an important value, it must satisfy some property. So this is the next job. If, if lambda can do this magic, if lambda can do this magic that I can solve the problem at t without worrying about what happens in future, that means I can decouple the present and the future, then that lambda must be as some magic and that magic must come from something. So that's what we're looking for now. What is this magic of lambda? Well, <clears throat> if you look at these guys, you can see that this doesn't depend on you. 
So I can cancel this out. So I have this. Now let's do the following. <clears throat> this is my optimal trajectory. Okay, so I don't want to go to whiteboard because it takes time. So let's say that the optimal trajectory is this trajectory. This trajectory. And I'm now going to find a, a trajectory very close to this. I'm going to call it X plus delta X. So that trajectory could be like this. Seems very, very close to this trajectory. But it's different than this trajectory. So I will call that a new trajectory. This is a new function which adds to that function, gives me that new trajectory I just, I, I just gave you like that. So I, that is a new trajectory, and, and, and the reason it's close to it is by this business. Remember, we have a norm. So that's a small trajectory. So I, that's a small trajectory, which I add to this trajectory. I get this neighborly, neighboring trajectory. It's neighboring trajectory only because that small trajectory has a norm less than epsilon. And that norm we defined in chapter one. By the way, this is about the only time we'll use this norm. That's it. I define all that in chapter one just to come here. We won't use much of a norm in many places, but this is about the, the most important place we use it. So what I do is I found a neighborhood of this trajectory. Okay. Well, at time instant t, <clears throat> this equation is simply this equation. So it says that at time t, if I am an optimal path, I get this. But suppose I change the trajectory to this trajectory. So what happens along this new trajectory? Well, it says along this new trajectory, that quantity must be bigger than that quantity. Why? And that quantity is zero from this. So the left-hand side zero comes from here. Okay, so left hand zero comes from here. So let's see. Left hand side zero from 19 because u star t maximizes h plus vt. So the right hand side will be zero if u star t. Okay, so this maximizes vt. So we already have this condition zero somewhere here, which is this one. Okay. But the right hand side, which is this one, would also be would right hand side will also be zero if this u star also maximizes along this new trajectory, which is a neighboring trajectory in function space. But in general, it is not going to be because if it maximizes this, why would it maximize at any other trajectory which is nearby? So in general, RHS will be less than or equal to zero. So we know this is zero. This is less than or equal to zero. But the only thing that change between this and this is X changing to X, X star changing to X. That means that this quantity maximizes this quantity at X equal to X star. Okay. So by calculus, I can take the derivative of right hand side. And when I substitute the derivative x star t, that has to be equal to zero. Because the right hand side is maximized at this point. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the derivative first order calculus. I'm going to take the derivative and equate it to zero. Okay. So the derivative of h respect to x and the derivative of vt with respect to x because that is the right hand side derivative with respect to x that has to be equal to zero. Now we can take the derivative of this quantity and that derivative in a single variable case will be f sub x plus vx fx plus vxxf. 
And but if you take the matrix matrix notation, we gave you some exercises, uh, homework, and also in chapter one we did this. So this basically derivative is given by this. In in multidimensional case, in single dimensional, just is easy anyway. But multidimensional, you need some extra transposes. What is the next? We'll substitute this in 2.24. And, and know that this is this is true because this is square matrix and V, v is twice. Now we are assuming that that now we're going to assume, by the way, when we write this, we are assuming that the V is twice differentiable. When we write this, we assume V is one time differentiable. This is not rigorous because V is what we want to find out. How can you assume V to be differentiable or second time differentiable? We, cannot, we don't have that guarantee. So here's what I'm going to tell you. If it is differentiable and second time differentiable, this proof goes through. And later on, when you solve the problem and find it is, it is so, then our proof is correct. If it is not, then our proof is not correct. But then there's another maximum principle which is more complicated, which we do not know how to derive in this book. That would take care of that. So what I'm trying to say is that this is not a rigorous proof, but it's good enough for our purpose, and it's very intuitive. Whereas a proof which is more rigorous doesn't assume this and doesn't use dynamic programming. It goes through calculus of variation. So it's a more complicated proof, much more mathematical requirement. We're not going to do that. <clears throat> okay. So all of this is now uses the derivative of matrices and vectors, and whatever we needed was done in chapter one and two exercises. Exercise was 1.10. Also, if you look at the equation 1.16, you can see that all of this is done. But but my own view is first only do that in single variable case. And if you can if you can satisfy yourself in a single variable case, then there is some way of matrix notation that will tweak this to make it proper for the matrix notation. That's all there is to it. So if it is if it's good for single variable, it can be tweaked to do to be good for multi multi multi-dimensional variables. That's all I'm going to say. So now we we have all of these business. And in order to write a few more things, I'm going to give you one more thing. I'm going to I'm going to now take the derivative of this because in the end we need lambda dot t. So I'm going to take the derivative of this, and that derivative is given by this because v sub x is a row vector. So I have this. You can spend that because this is total derivatives, the total derivative is taking the derivative of that with respect to x and then x dot, and then take the derivative with respect to t, so this is the first term, second term, third term, so on line the line. This can be done in terms of sigma, taking component wise, and this, this part can be added, so this is a row vector, this is a row vector, this is the, adding these two row vectors is a row vector. And then if you take the row vector and a matrix, it's another row vector because there's a matrix and a column vector, so that becomes column vector and the transpose is a row vector. This is a row vector. All of these are row vectors, so we get this, this equation. This is also done in exercise in, in, in chapter one. So using those exercises and that little matrix notation, we get this. In 2.26, note the following things. We have this equal to that, and that matrix is given by that. So now with 2.25 and 2.6, we can write dvx dt, which is, there's a dvx dt, and we can write dvx dt as this quantity. So this is coming from, this is coming from 2.25 and 2.26. You can see 2.25 and 2.6, you see there's a, there's a v, dv dx, dv dx is given by, this quantity, so this quantity appears in this formula here. See this formula appears right here. So we have this formula, we can substitute that, and by using this, we get this. 
this is this is nothing but lambda dot because we have sub axis lambda, so this is lambda dot. So I have the lambda dot equation. This is also equal to so. So I have an equation like that. So the lambda for to do its magic has to satisfy an equation, and we also know that lambda t is the terminal value of the salvage value. So if you take the derivative of that, we will give lambda t because that is the derivative of the value function. At capital T, the value function every capital T is exactly s. So this is my lambda t. So let's see what we have done so far. This is what we have done. This is the maximum principle. So let's let's spend a few minutes to see what's going on. We are saying, suppose u star t from t to zero t is optimal. And suppose when I put that optimal control here, I get the trajectory x star. So the x star satisfies this equation. Remember, I don't use T. That is a standard notation in control theory. You don't keep using T all the time. So you suppress T. But that T is there. X star dot T. It's, it's implicit. And lambda dot. So this is the equation. This is the initial condition. This is the equation of lambda. This is the final condition. So I have two differential equations. One with the initial condition, one with the final condition. And so if u star t is optimal with the corresponding trajectory x star t, then at every time t, this Hamiltonian is maximized. That means this is bigger than or equal to that. That means that every time t, this u this U star solves a static optimization problem at every time t, given that lambda. So if you knew the lambda, we can, we can do this. We can just keep doing this at each time t and build the control U star. But we don't know lambda. But the lambda can be solved by using these two equations, and we call that as two-point boundary value problem. That means one boundary is the beginning, one boundary is the end, so it's called the two-point boundary value problem. It's two differential equations if x is one-dimensional. It is two n differential equations if x is n-dimensional. What are we going to do now? We're going to do several things. We're going to ah. okay. Um, please, anyone. We want to take a break, you know, holler and we can take a break. If you don't want to take a break, you tell me you don't want to take a break. If I want to take a break, I will tell you I want to take a break, okay? Are we good? I want to have a five minute break. Okay, okay, everybody five minute break.